at least one of us. Right. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, so quick background, my name is Sandy Lacey. I'm the executive director of the Howe Innovation Center at the Perkins School for the Blind. We have been, um, we launched this year. So we basically had year zero, which was a lot of research and understanding into what was happening in the space of at the intersection of innovation, entrepreneurship, and disability. And um, in March of this year, we basically said, hello world, we are here. And what we really wanna do is connect the community of people with disabilities with the innovation community. That's our main focus. Uh, you can find out more about us by going to perkins.org slash innovation center. Um, and there'll also be a link at the end of this at, at the end of this uh, event, but I just wanted to thank our hosts at the A11Y Boston Meetup for having us. And I'm gonna kick us off into a panel discussion. So we have three excellent entrepreneurs from the Boston uh, tech ecosystem that are working in disability and accessibility. And um, I'm actually gonna ask the first question and then pass it around, which is, can you introduce yourself and your company and explain how your product contributes to increasing accessibility for people with disabilities? And I'm going to um, ask uh, Samantha to go first because it is uh, Deaf Blindness Awareness Month. So Samantha, you get to kick us off. So much, Sandy. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for highlighting Deaf Blind Awareness Month, our favorite month here at Tatum Robotics. I am the founder of Tatum Robotics, and we're developing assistive communication tools for people with deaf blindness. So people with deaf blindness, their, prior, their main communication language tends to be tactile sign. When they're having conversations with interpreters or communication partners, they hold on to the hand of their communication partner. And as a result, they can't tend to do this independently. So we're developing the first tool that will connect to mainstream communication tools, whether that be your computer, emails, eBooks, so that they can access communication independently. Fantastic. All right. And uh, Brittany, let's go over to you next. Uh, hi, my name is Brittany Palmer. I'm the founder and CEO of Beyonder. And um, we are revolutionizing the way that people travel and experience the world with a live and interactive uh, virtual travel platform. So um, guests can come in and take tours with our guides that are in uh, almost 60 countries and take a tour just as if they were there in person via um, a tablet or their computer in real time um, and see the sites of Venice or uh, or explore Uganda. Um, and uh, we are primarily B2B, but we work with senior groups and uh, people that have uh, disabilities and, and limited mobility and other conditions that prevent or inhibit travel, uh, as well as um, kind of everything in between. And uh, and so, yeah, really excited to be here today. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, of course. All right, Alex, take us away. Uh, I'm Alex Wessner. I'm the co-founder of Xander. Uh, we are looking at hearing loss and when we get into hearing loss, we see, oh, wow, there's hundreds of hearing devices to help people hear better, um, but they often fall short. And in uh, using a concept at sensory substitution, which, which um, I think we all need to do in, in some ways in accessibility, um, we're using augmented reality, these glasses, uh, to supplement hearing loss. So that if I put on these glasses, I'm having a conversation what they do is they'll take uh, the speech of whoever's talking to me, transcribe them into text and, and display them right about here in my field of view. So as you're talking to me, I'll actually get real time captions of conversations. And that's that is what we're up to. And these are the glasses. So cool. So cool. Um, all right, I'm going to go back to Sam and ask, you know, what motivated you to start working on a product that addresses accessibility challenges? Was there a personal experience or a specific incident that inspired you to step into this field? Yeah, so actually, I actually went to college because I wanted to pursue assistive technology. Kind of growing up, I was involved in unified sports and kind of having communication with my special needs peers in education. And then when I went to college, that was something I was prioritizing in my studies. But it actually wasn't until I actually met a person with deafblindness that I was actually 
inspired to move into that very niche space. Mm -hmm. So I had taken some ASL classes during my undergraduate and met a deaf blind woman around campus. And I began chatting with her through an interpreter and was fascinated by how much communication she could receive through tactile signing and asked her how she communicated independently kind of in her home. And she told me that if she was at home alone, she couldn't read a book. She couldn't call a friend because she didn't know Braille. She wasn't, she had no vision to read large print. And it wasn't until actually COVID when articles started coming out of deafblind people crawling through the streets and crawling through buildings because they had no access to information that I actually kind of got reinvolved with that community. I, when I met the woman, I actually learned about the Boston Deafblind Contact Center that she was a part of, and I got their information and, become, and just kind of kept up with their events. And then once COVID hit, I reached out and asked if there was any way I could support the community, if there's anything I could make. And we started collaborating on a device for communication for them. So it became a very collaborative effort. And it was something that has been really inspiring along the way, starting with just kind of the Boston Deafblind community, now growing to the Connecticut Deafblind. We were just at the Helen Keller National Center last week to really see how this tool could really help support the greater deafblind community. Wow. Um, what's like, what, can you talk a little bit about like the, the market sizing of, of your community? Yeah, so deaf blindness is really on a wide, wide scale as a lot of disabilities are. So there are people with profound deafness and blindness and there are people with low vision and low hearing. And they say that kind of globally, there's about 150 million people worldwide with deaf blindness. In the U.S., those numbers obviously quite vary, but they say anywhere between, you know, hundreds of thousands to two million deafblind people in the U.S. So it's something that the numbers are quite underreported, as with many disabilities, but it's something that we're actually working now with the Helen Keller National Center to really try to understand what those statistics are and really what they mean for what, you know, as technology they need to support them. Are they deafblind in the way that they need large print? Or are they deaf in the way that they need tactile signing support? So really trying to understand what that landscape looks like. Absolutely. Okay. Um, why don't we go to, I'm going to switch it up. Alex, why don't we go to you next? Um, and why don't you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to, to get into this space? Yeah, so um, it, it, it was not a, not a predictable path, but my, my whole career was in audio technology and sound and, yeah. and, and working with teams to analyze sound and process speech and noise. Um, but what really got me started was, was sort of a personal experience of, I was diagnosed with a form of macular degeneration. Um, it's very mild and I, and I do pretty well, but as an audio person, I was thinking, oh my gosh, should I, am I going to be relying on sound and audio? Is that really going to be my thing? Is that why I'm in sound? So I started as an entrepreneur researching product ideas. And what I learned was, oh, there's a lot of people working on that. Uh, as a as a human, that's great for me and other people like me. But as an entrepreneur, I just had nothing else to add. But I was really interested in this idea of sensory substitution. So um, my wife and I, who's uh, also a co-founder in this company, Marilyn, uh, we just started looking at hearing loss instead, learning about hearing loss and learning about um, this this idea of using AR and smart glasses as as a visual substitute for when you can't hear. Um, we started putting prototypes together. We started talking to people and it was just an instant hit. I could go on about why, but yeah, it was really just an instant um, uh, success there. As, as far as market sizing, we were also, I mean, it's, it's good news and bad news as an entrepreneur, which is in the US alone, there's almost 50 million people with hearing loss. Uh, the, the WHO is now estimating one and a half billion people worldwide with hearing loss, which is just astounding. Um, uh, and, and so for better and for worse, there are plenty of people who, who need these kinds of uh, technologies that, that we're all looking at. Yeah. All right. Um, Brittany, you're next. Yeah. So um, I uh, was born with a disability, um, missing both of my arms from below the elbow. And um, so I grew up always adapting and making sure that I could do everything myself. Um, and, but I do love to travel. Um, it has sometimes it's, uh, its difficulties and I have some joint issues with my knees that make it difficult to walk long distances without being in a lot of pain. Um, I also have experience as a caregiver. Um, and so I knew what it was like to really not um, be able to travel 
or you know to care for someone that had a uh, limited ability to to mm -hmm. to go places um and when covid shut down or shut everything down and no one could travel i thought you know when i saw little things about virtual travel coming out i thought wow i think everyone needs to be able to see this and and experience the world in different cultures and be able to see places that they might not get to see in person. And so I started the marketplace for that um, and, uh, you know, to really provide equal access and inclusiveness to, uh, to the travel uh, industry. Um, in, in terms of market size, just in the US, there are more than 40 million people with limited mobility or other conditions that prevent or inhibit travel. Sometimes you think of just, you know, people with physical limitations, but there are people with agoraphobia and a fear of flying. And there are many baby boomers, like 32% of them say health concerns limit travel. Mm -hmm. And so there's just such a huge number of people um, that have a limited ability to travel. And I really wanted to help those people see the world. Awesome. Yeah. Opening up the doors. I love it. Um, all right. So, you know, a lot of the times at Perkins, we get uh, inbound inquiries um, from student groups, entrepreneurs, even Fortune 100 companies um, asking for access to people within our community for either primary market research or user testing. And I'm curious um, if you could each talk to how you involve people with disabilities in the design and development process of your product? What stage of the process do you bring them in? Um, and how important is the feedback uh, when you're when you're shaping you know, your business? So I'm gonna switch it up again. I'm gonna go to Alex first. I'm just trying to keep you all on your toes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're very customer, uh, I don't know what the right word is, influenced. I mean, I think everything we do has to be around the customer. I mean, it's it's so hard. What is, there's a quote I like from a thought leader, which is life is too short to build a product that nobody wants. And I think the way you really do that is by, by just living with the customer. You can't just test something a year after you've developed it. You really need to just inhabit and live with that customer's problems and their and their pains and, and their solutions. And they don't always know what they want or what's gonna help them, that's our job. So, you know, at what stage? I mean, I think even before you even have an idea, you can um, spend more time with that customer. You really need to love the customer that you have. You just have to. If, you, if you're finding yourself annoyed by your customers, you're in the wrong job, in the wrong field, do something else. But I think, so, you know, even as you're, you know, coming up with a concept for an idea, I think, your ideas will only be refined by the deeper you uh, learn about your customers' problems and their goals and what they're trying to do and what they can't do. Um, so I, I just think it, you, you have nothing if you're not really embodying um, the customer sort of every day in your design and your thinking. But also, and again, a lot of people focus on the product. Um, I think in our space, we have to also think about the business model and the pricing and the access and the distribution that can often be as challenging or more challenging than building the solution is how do you actually get it to people? How do you get it to someone in a way that they can afford it? And mm -hmm. is there even enough margin in there where you can do all of that and still keep the lights on in your company? So it's a, that's where a lot of the, a lot of the challenges um, so I answered the customer question, but I know there was another one in there. <laughs> no, that's helpful. I'm just, I'm curious, you know, how have you gone about finding people with hearing? Oh, yeah, I didn't ask that, but I'm piggybacking on it. Yeah, um, I think for, for us, hearing loss is so common. It's something nobody talks about unless you start talking about it. And right. what we learned is once you start talking about it, oh, my mom is has hearing loss. My dad has hearing loss. He doesn't have a hearing aid. Like Once you start getting out there and talking to people, you can find people nearby to, to meet up with and test. And the way we first got started, it was... A month before COVID lockdown, we just did phone calls, Zoom calls, text, whatever we could to, to find people to talk to. Um, but it actually wasn't as hard as we thought it might be because 
people are out there if you just um, if you just reach them. I think where we started to get more people was when we connected with uh, like people who are more actively involved in an organization. So there's the Hearing Loss Association of America, there's local chapters. So we had the fortune of being introduced to the president of the Boston chapter. And uh, she's also a tech skeptic. And so she was one of our first interviewees. And we thought she didn't like the product at all. We sat with her for 45 minutes and we thought she just wasn't impressed. Um, but we got an email from her two hours later saying, Alex, you know, normally in, a, in an hour long conversation, I'd be laid out with a headache destroyed because it takes so much energy. But she said, when I was wearing your glasses, I feel fine. Like, it was a lot easier for me to have that conversation. And she said, that's when I felt like there's something there. Um, so so I think it's it's really the networking, but then starting to get lucky and find the 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 influencers who will start to uh, um, get excited about what you're doing and bring more people in for you. So you're, mm. that's really the where you get that multiplier. For sure. Okay, Brittany, what about you? Uh, yeah, so... Um, I'm kind of part of my target market, but I'm only one of many. Um, so one of the uh, one of the first things I actually did was develop a survey, and I used SurveyMonkey to um, uh, the paid version of it to send out uh, surveys to people using their their uh, services. Um, with the initial question of, you know, do you have limitations that prevent you from traveling? And so I was able to get information if they wanted to share it um, about what prevented them from traveling and what their interest level is and a number of things that I was considering. And so that was extremely helpful because it also made me see that people can sit like things that I didn't even think about, like bond parole can't leave their seat so they can't travel so there was lots of different angles people with agoraphobia I hadn't even thought of that when I first started out so um, lots of different things that I learned from the responses there and then I hired a um, a design firm to help me I, ha I already had thoughts of how I wanted it to look but they helped me refine the design um, using like Figma type um, mockups, and then doing user interviews. And we used a company called userinterviews.com, I believe. And we've used them again just a couple months ago when we were releasing something new. And you can dictate who you want, like the types of people you want to interview and go through them and choose many different characteristics um, and that was so helpful to be able to see that and get feedback directly from them. Um, we also eventually hired a product manager who um, helps me keep track of all things related to product. He, you know, is constantly reviewing the website and talking to current customers and um, potential customers, like with our salespeople, he sits in on calls and asks them various questions about like what they're looking for. And then, of course, we also rely on reviews of like the tours that we have and other things to kind of refine what we're doing and and how we go about it or the different things that that people are looking for. Um, so all of that has been really helpful for us. And I, I you know, you have to be able to talk to your customers. And uh, if, if you want to design something that they're going to use. Yeah, really helpful uh, suggestions in there too. And just the fact that you like started listening, you know, you started doing primary market research. Um, yeah. A lot of folks skip that step. You know, they like, oh, they have the idea. They have the solution to the problem without truly understanding the problem statement first. So really fascinating. Um, okay, Samantha, you're up next. Yeah, um, we naturally at the idea kind of was partnered with the Deaf Blind Contact Center in Boston. So we were definitely working with the Deaf Blind Contact Center from the very beginning. And we, I think all three of our companies actually started in COVID era, which definitely did make it quite tricky, especially with deaf blind folks who cannot really access communication outside of that in-person interviews. So we spent a lot of time in those early days 
you know, relying on advocates who or family members to communicate with the local deafblind folks. So we did spend probably the first year only talking to deafblind people in Boston, which was great. But as we all know about design for disabilities, if you design for one person, it will help that one person. So that's something that we've definitely been trying to now really expand on who we're talking to and making sure that we talk to people with various disabilities when they became deafblind at different times where they learned to sign and really trying to understand how those would vary the needs of our device. And it's actually been a really fun design challenge because nothing's really been designed for deafblind people before. So even maybe simple questions of, you know, how do we tell them where to put their hand on the device? You know, like we, we have to ask really all these questions and design so many prototypes and thank goodness for you know 3d printers and low-cost manufacturing that we can really iterate really quickly and have a lot of options when we get to you know be in the room with deafblind people and i think similarly to what alex said of you know you can't just design this super awesome thirty thousand dollar robot because it won't actually help anybody at that point if you create technology that it, it fits checks all your boxes but isn't accessible at the end of the day you won't be helping anybody so we've spent a good amount of time also talking to the the buyers you know the deafblind people themselves for the most part won't be the buyers in our case it will be programs like i can connect or it could be school systems so that those are the people we need to understand what those processes look like to make sure that this falls into the budgets and so that this will be helpful for the deafblind people that we're working with so it's been something that we've you know have become in the time that I was a really elementary signer, I'm now, you know, a proficient signer so I can communicate with all of our potential users. And it's been a really fun experience being able to work with a such a historically underserved community who really does show that excitement that what we're developing could really be helpful for, for their everyday. Yeah. Um, you know, Sam, you, you kind of did an excellent segue into my next question, which is all around... Um, balancing affordability and accessibility. So we're all building products to unlock access to something, right? Whether that's uh, communication or uh, travel and cultural immersion, essentially. And, um, you know, assistive technology, spe specifically hardware, uh, tends to come with uh, a very, very high price tag. And this has been you know, a thorn for the assistive tech community for a very long time. And I'm curious, um, you know, we've seen a lot of great innovation in this space. I've seen a lot of products uh, be priced at more accessible price points um, as, you know, more programs have been developed or entrepreneurs have gotten savvier around uh, different types of business models. I'm, I would so love to hear how, um, particularly the two of you with a, a product that is, you know, a, a physical product, um, how you're, you know, addressing this challenge as you build your companies. And Brittany, you're also free to weigh in if if you have anything to add to. Um, Alex, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, it's, it is, you know, it's, it is a little disappointing. You have a great solution and, uh, Sometimes these costs are just not really out of our control. It's not like we're marking up um, products because we're we're greedy capitalists. I mean, it's just hardware is expensive. And I think when you're when you're building something new, especially, you don't have volume. You don't have like the volume you're gonna to to scale and get pricing down. And when it's new, sometimes the technologies are new, and so the the parts that you're sourcing are still new. Like in our case of of AR glasses, it's still, they've been around for maybe 10 years, but they're still relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not, they're still expensive uh, for a lot of good reasons. Um, a lot of it has to do with the optics. Uh, but I think what we're starting to do, you know, is try to make the best product and find ways to help people pay for it. I think we started to feel like as we looked at ways to bring the cost of the product down we were starting to compromise too much on the experience and the quality and the benefit mm. and i think starting out as a first product i think we want to put our best foot forward and make the best product we can and if it's expensive um you know unfortunately that limits the number of people who can pay for it you know with, on their own in, the, in their own means and we are starting to look into, well, how can we help people pay? What, are, what programs are available from the government, from, from not-for-profits, from, from other from employers? We're doing a lot of research now with 
employer accommodations, um, we're finding that, um, yeah, employers are A, happy to and often legally obligated to purchase these kinds of accommodations for their employees. So I think we're, we're now learning more about how do we help our customers pay for our expensive, more expensive product? <laughs> That's the short term. Long term, we are looking at ways to reduce the cost to, um, with different design ideas. But for the short term, we want to make the best product and then figure out how to pe help people pay for it. Yeah. And Alex, that's a great point. You don't get a second chance at a first impression, right? So you want the product to provide enough value that the initial customer is going to be excited about it and amplifying the message, right? So not compromising that quality is, um, is incredibly important. You know, there's a, I, I recently learned that to get like an advanced, uh, calculus textbook, like a college level calculus textbook in Braille, it can take a year and a half to have it get printed and it can cost $35,000. And when you, you know, there's a mechanism to offset that price uh, for that book. But if a Braille tablet is $10,000 and any book can be piped into it using electronic Braille, different story, right? So um, we all are going to have to think creatively and collaboratively in this ecosystem to make sure that these technologies, advanced technologies can get out there and so that we can see the prices come down so that we can potentially avoid the old way we've been doing things, which might not be very cost efficient um, or effective either. Um, Brittany or Sam, do you have anything to add on the um, affordability side? Yeah, I'll jump in. I think we definitely had a very similar experience to Alex is the first thing when we were designing is we were just trying to make a very low cost product. And slowly but surely, we just realized it didn't work. You know, it can be super low cost, but if it doesn't do anything, it, it, again, it's just, it's just not helpful. So what we decided to do is when we kind of created our design requirements at first, you know, the first thing you do in product development is you make a list of all the things this thing needs to do. So we really started prioritizing them. So maybe, you know, it might be heavier weight because we have to use some bigger motors, but it can be still low cost, because, lower cost because we're using these bulkier motors, something like that. And seeing what kind of off the shelf components we can use, again, maybe it might not be as fast as it could possibly be, but it can still be within a certain price point. So I think that was one of the main ways that we, we did try to cut costs as much as possible is by using as much off the shelf as we can, again, using low cost manufacturing methods, and I think a big thing, especially with hardware companies, is it's not even at the end of the day how much the product costs, but you have to put a lot of money into it. And I think that's why a lot of companies, it's really hard to form a hardware company in assistive tech because you can't get those big early checks that you get from VCs for assistive technology, but you need that to build hardware, you know, like buying, you have to buy all of these 3D printers if you're going to 3D print something that might be low cost, but you have to buy the equipment. So I think that's often why, you know, you see a lot of assistive technology in academia because they have those resources for you, but it makes it really hard for that transition outside of academia because then, you know, you're on your own and you need to then put up those, those early fronted costs. So I think that having, you know, more of an ecosystem like this, it can be then a little bit more there can be some community around it and you can share some of those resources. But I think also kind of having those early stage interviews where we talk to these programs of these are the price points that it needs to fall into was really a helpful conversation for us because we realized it has to cost this much. You know, we, we were able to really work, work backwards from that number in a lot of ways that, you know, and, and then if it didn't work, we could then have to, we'd have to have some bigger conversations about what needs to be compromised or what can be compromised. If it's not possible, why is it not? And then what could be reevaluated? So I think there's a lot that goes into pricing of hardware. And hopefully it's one of those things that at the end of the day, everything can be optimized in a way that you create a really effective product and still at a price point that people can afford to purchase it. Yeah. But I do agree with Alex that I think people do expect you create assistive technology. They expect you to sell it for pennies because you're helping people. But at the end of the year, there's a lot more than pennies in it. So it really <laughs> does kind of create a little bit of a juxtaposition. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Brittany, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, we're more on like a, uh, online services type uh, company in terms of the tours being virtual, um, but we still had class to contend with because guides, um, you know, need to get paid uh, for their time and we have to be competitive, like very competitive with in-person tours because all of our guides also do in-person tours. 
And we want to make sure that they are more than willing to, you know, drop what they're doing and do tours for our customers. And so part of the way that we do that was it was made the price point that they get for tours very, um, you know, positive for them. And uh, but by doing that, we had to make sure that our customers could afford it. And we started out really with um, with like senior living groups. And we we did so much price uh, like price changing and modifications and talking to groups and figuring out what we needed to do. And ultimately, we sort of decided that B2B was the way to go on our end. So we put the onus on the organization um, and the companies to pay for it and make it worth their while in terms of the benefits that their members get or their employees get. Mm. And um, and then we developed a special program because all of our tours are private um, and there's a minimum price point. We've developed a special program for individuals and organizations that are seniors or people with disabilities to join and they take tours together. So it's at a reduced cost individually, but they all join in on the same tour. And so the tour guide still gets a good amount of money, but the groups that really can't afford to pay more are don't have to. So it was, it's still a lot of, you know, uh, messing with pricing and, and evaluating it and determining, you know, the best price points. It's, so difficult now yeah. it is it is there's whole classes on this at, in MBA programs on like the science of pricing um and I think that in this specific space we have a lot of um uh price sensitive customers in the disability community and in the aging population as well so um we really do have you know you've all spoken very eloquently to how constructively we have to think about this as we build companies and products in this space. I have one more question um, that I want to ask, and then we'll, we should have around 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A from the audience. Um, my question is really around other entrepreneurs. So what advice or encouragement would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs who are interested in developing products that enhance accessibility uh, for people with disabilities? And so um, I don't think I've had Brittany go first yet, so I'm going to pass it over to Brittany. Okay. Um, so I think building your network at the beginning um, and talking to as many people as possible about your idea um, and fine tuning it and going back to the drawing board and not being afraid to say, this isn't working, let's do something else. Um, if you're not getting the, if you're consistently not getting the feedback that you think you should be getting, um, that the user aspect that we talked about earlier, I just feel is so important. And then if, you know, a lot of us fundraise, if you are fundraising, starting to create your ecosystem of, of people and looking at resources is just so important in the early stages. I couldn't agree more. We could have a whole other how I built this on fundraising, probably, um, which maybe maybe we will do that. Uh, Sam, you want to go next? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Brittany definitely hit the nail on the head of just make sure you're making something that people want. You know, I think a lot of creating disability tech can be controversial sometimes, especially, you know, as myself, as a hearing sighted engineer going into a deaf blind space, that can be controversial to make sure that what you're doing is coming out of the community. It's not something that you're pushing technology onto other people. You had this really cool idea and you're pushing it on to these people that maybe don't need the or want the technology. It's really, as Brittany mentioned, have those interviews, make sure that this community is coming out of their needs and their wants. And it's something that you're developing kind of in that in that bubble with them, not kind of out, outside of it. And I think it's one of those things that at the end of the day, we're also really making really cool technology. So I think although we are sitting in the disability space, there are a lot of resources for companies making really cool technology. Most of the money we've gotten so far isn't actually because we're creating disability tech, it's because we are just creating a deep technology and there's resources and grants for things like that. So I think taking your technology for what it is in that use case, but also extrapolating a little bit and see what kind of resources can come from that. Right now we sit in an incubator for robotics, which comes with its own resources and community. 
despite us being an assistive technology company, and that's what our focus is, and that's what our part is, we can build a community in the robotics space as well. So really finding out what kind of homes you can sit in as an entrepreneur in that space. Yeah, it's not, it's so not a silo. I mean, this this market of disability tech overlaps with so many other markets, whether it's AI or deep tech or um, inclusive technology. I mean, there's really just a, so age tech, there's so many different overlaps. Um, so it's really, in, it's really cool to hear that you're leveraging an already established space around the technology sector that you're in. Um, maybe not the audience sector that you're in, which is really cool. Um, Alex, go ahead. Why don't you wrap us up? Yeah, um, definitely. Yes. Plus one to, uh, Brittany and Samantha's, uh, comments. I think, um, you know, be, um, when you're getting to know your customers and spending time with them, I think what's really helpful is get to understand the solutions that they use now. So we talk about getting to understand our customers, understand what their problems are, but spend just as much time figuring out, well, what do they do now? How do they solve this problem today? And, and understand how those products work and how those solutions work and where are the shortcomings of those? And so, because your job is actually to make a better version of the thing that they're already trying to do and, and, and it's not doing enough. And so you have to also educate yourself on that kind of, uh, I don't know, system of, of different solutions that people use. And sometimes solution isn't a product. It's, it's a behavior. That's right. really interesting. So, right. Yeah. It might be an avoidance behavior, like, oh, I just don't go to this specific place because I can't, you know, communicate in this environment. Or it might be um, a relationship with someone. There's so many different workarounds that people do develop um, in order to continue accessing the world. Um, this has been awesome. I have a slide. So Derek, I, I don't know if I have like sharing capabilities. I'm going to see if I can. I think I can share this. So I think I took over, sorry mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I really just, I wanted to share this um, one slide here, which basically has our contact information on it. So it has Brittany's email address, Samantha's email address, and Alex's. Um, all the URLs are the end of their emails. There's a QR code also on the right side, which brings you to uh, the How Innovation Center community sign up. Um, or you could go to perkins.org slash innovation. Um, and I, me and my team can be reached at innovation at perkins.org. Don't worry, it goes directly to my inbox because our team is uh, very small. <laughs> um, and yeah, so if you want to use this uh, QR code to join our community, we'd love to have you. It brings you to, it lets you access our um, computer visualizations of the database that we've built, which has around 750 companies in the disability tech space. And we're working on uh, basically market sizing and market, market mapping and really trying to understand where the activity is happening within um, investments and innovation in the space of uh, products for people with disabilities. So if you use this QR code to join, um, it will then bring you to the, the database, which is which is pretty cool. Um, but I'd, we'd love to open it up for questions from the audience. So if anybody um, who's joined us tonight has a question uh, for the entrepreneurs on the panel, we would be happy to answer it. Uh, feel free to either unmute yourself or um, put it in the chat. Goodbye. Actually, while we're waiting, for, I have a question, but while we're waiting, I'd like to just read these emails and names yes, for the transcript please. Please do. of the video. Yes. So um, with Brittany Palmer, who is from Tatum Robotics is Brittany at beyonder.com. So that's B R I T T A N Y. Uh, Brittany, at... Brittany's at Beyonder. Yeah. Samantha's at Tatum Robotics. Oh, I'm so. sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. We're going to cut that <laughs> video. I'm sorry. Brittany Palmer, and it's Brittany at beyonder.com, B R I T T A N Y at beyonder, B E E Y O N D E R.com. And then Samantha Johnson, who is at Tatum Robotics, is S Johnson at TatumRobotics.com. That's S J O H N S O N at Tatum Robotics, T A T U M R O B O T I C S dot com. And finally, Alex Westner, who is with Xander. That's Alex at Xander.tech, A 
L-E-X at X-A-N-D-E-R dot P-E-C-H. And then, of course, the How Innovation Center is innovation at Perkins.org, I-N-N-O-V-A-T-I-O-N at Perkins, P-E-R-K-I-N-S dot org. Sorry, that was a while, but I just wanted to make sure we have it in the transcript. And Sandy, you're muted. I had to stop the share to unmute myself, but I think we got okay. it all in there anyways. Mm -hmm. um, no, I appreciate that. Thank you very much because that um, allows everybody on the call to, to know how to contact us. Um, and we do have a question, but Derek, you said you had a question first. Do you want to kick us off? Um, sure. Um, I, so I work in the education right now, but I don't, and didn't always. And one of the arguments we always had to make in the private sector was that you should also make things accessible because kind of you're leaving a lot of money on the table. There's this whole community of people that could be using what you have, but they can't. And, and I wonder if when you're developing these products, you have a hard time finding people who will invest and understand that, yeah, this is, these are consumers like anyone else. Um, has that been something that's made it difficult or is there a particular group of people who understand this or, or have you had to address that? sort of issue with the investors, I guess, the people who, who are going to invest in the products. I'll jump Alex, in. Go ahead. That was really, yeah, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I learned it, when I first started pitching our company to investors, I, as you do, you talk about the customer, you talk about the problem. And what I learned was that as soon as I talked about hearing loss, I think what was happening in the investor's mind was they're picturing a senior in an assistive living community uh, with no money. And they're like, yeah, I'm not interested. And so I tried changing the pitch. I've tried doing a lot of things. And then I realized, no, I'm just talking to the wrong investors. So um, I think that's the key is just you need to micro focus on a much more selective and smaller group of people who are going to have that empathy for what you're trying to do. It's really hard to to teach or force someone to care. They have to sort of come in with that, with that empathy. And it makes it harder to find investors, but um, to me, that's been the only way. Yeah, I think just piggybacking on that, I think there's this big push recently that every company needs to be a venture-backed company. And I think especially in this space, that is much harder to do. But I think as Alex mentioned, there's there's a lot of money out there that specifically is not in venture money, which is looking, you know, for that 10 times return over a course of a year, whatever, staggering numbers that they want. And I think that there's, you know, there's angels out there, there's debt, there's bank loans, there's a lot of ways that you can finance your company. And I think that making sure you find people that stand behind your vision is really important. I've given a lot of pitches where they're like, oh, sure, but you know, you made a really cool robot arm. And what if you used it for strawberry picking, <laughs> you know? And <laughs> I think that it's something that we're doing this obviously for a reason, for one purpose, and the robotics was a means to an end for that reason. So I think making sure that as you're speaking to investors, you make sure that you have people on that same page is, is really important. Yeah, I, I agree, um, especially starting out uh, during COVID with a virtual travel company, all I got was, well, isn't this just a pandemic related company? And I can't tell you how many times I, and I had a whole slide on market and how many people have disabilities. And I, I had to tell them over and over and over again, I'm not even talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about oh. all of these tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world that before the pandemic and after the pandemic and like, they're still going to be in the same position. Um, and a lot of people also really didn't know about the senior space and mm. social isolation really wasn't brought to the forefront, I think, until the, the pandemic. Um, and so it's just it, you have to do a really good job of explaining to people and giving them examples of your target market. So those user personas are so important when you're pitching. Um, and making sure they understand just how big in dollars that that market is. Um, a lot of people just really don't realize or and and have and have no idea about the the size of the community. 
Mm. Mm. Um, I'm going to be chuckling about the strawberry picking robot arm for a while, you know, and it's like, and it's right. Like you're just, you're, de- you're, you're, de- you know, you're building your company for a problem, right? Brittany, your comment, you know, I'm building this for the people. The problem was before the pandemic and it's going to be a problem after the pandemic. And Alex, I think you just hit it, hit the nail on the head. You know, like I'm talking to the wrong investors. Um, eventually, like the investors will come along that are, they're listening, you know, like they're listening to the story that you're telling. They're not bringing their preconceived notions of the market to the table. Um really like really fascinating. I do think we could have a whole other discussion on fundraising in this space. Um, I want to, you know, also just say to the three of you starting companies during the pandemic, like during COVID, not easy. Uh, So incredibly like just well done that your companies are still standing and flourishing right now is a testament to your, you know, your business leadership. Um, We have one question in the chat that I want to read out loud. It's from uh, Mia Correa, and sh- and Mia says, I find it difficult to advertise to the disability population, but do you have any suggestions for advertising to the blind and visually impaired market more specifically? So I guess, uh, Samantha, we'll have you, we'll have you take that one. I'll jump in first on that one. Um, I think it's, it's definitely not easy to do. Um, and I think something that's really important is just really making sure that you add that alt text, adding just picture descriptions, and really just making sure that the content that visually, imp- that people with vision access is the same that the visually impaired people are accessing. I think that with alt text, you can be pretty lazy about it. Like if it's a picture of me, it's like woman in frame, but you really want to be very specific and really make sure that that access is still there. I'm not going to say that we have really hit the nail on the head in advertising because we naturally don't spend that much time or effort on it because we, our market is deaf blind people, which is, you know, a whole, a whole nother barrier in itself. But I think really just making sure that it is accessible is really a great first step in, in making sure that they feel like their needs are heard that way. I think on this question too, it might not even necessarily be about, I don't want to speak for Mia, but um, about like reaching your population, you know? So you can try to reach people through advertisements, you know, via social or, you know, radio or print, however you want to do that. Um, But, you know, how would you suggest reaching your population? I I know you mentioned, Samantha, um, like partnerships with local organizations. Yeah, that's that is our biggest story. Oh, sorry, I did I did misunderstand the question. Um, but no, yeah, no, absolutely. you didn't. She said she said advert. It, the question says advertising, but I I'm assuming that maybe it's also beyond that. Yeah, I think that especially there are so many community groups, and I think that a lot of people with disabilities do tend to be part of community groups, which is tends to be the pattern that we've seen. So I think it can be a really great way to also show your interest and show that you're kind of willing to kind of go above and beyond for these communities is by, you know, making those trips out and having, you know, some braille business cards and really showing up kind of ready to kind of present what you have to offer to those communities. We, and again, Alex kind of offered as well, finding kind of leadership in those positions can help really open doors. We went to the Helen Keller's National Center last week and they're like, we have this registry of tens of thousands of deaf blind people. You can now, you know, use this registry. So really finding those people that know where your potential stakeholders are will be really key in helping you kind of find them and out in, out in, wherever they are in the States or globally. I would just add one experience we've seen, which is um, about, I'll I'll say maybe one out of three, maybe a third of the people who come into our website, sign up for our waiting list, are actually friends or family members of the person they're writing for. So I think friends, families, caregivers are a huge, huge, huge demographic. They're a little harder and trickier to find, but uh, they're they're different to find, I would say. But it's a huge population. It's it's probably where you can get a little more creative um, thinking about your your marketing and your outreach. It's not you don't always have to go right to the person, right to the end user. There's there's other ways that you can reach people in their circle who care about them. Mm. 
Yes, that that makes a lot of sense. The kid, the adult kid who buys the product for the parent or whatnot, um, or you know, in Brittany's instance, being a B two B and selling uh, to uh, you know facilities that are supporting the elderly population. So I think that there's a variety of different ways to to reach the customer. Um, awesome, you three are three of my favorite people. I'm I am very very grateful for you doing this first. You know how I built this um, episode. I think that you know you're all doing something that truly moves the needle on you know making our world a more accessible place. And I can't thank you enough for the work that you're doing. And uh, for joining us tonight, I want to thank everyone also who dialed in. Uh, this has been a wonderful experience learning about, you know, your your journeys and entrepreneurship. Thank you, Derek um, and Eric from uh, the Boston A One One Y Meetup Group for hosting us. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone soon in person. Yeah. And thank you, Sandy. You did a lot of work to put this together, so we really appreciate your My work too. My pleasure. I love using my megaphone for good. So <laughs> all fun. Um, all right. Well, thank you all so much. I hope everyone has, has a great night and thank you all for joining. Thank, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.